not a circumcision. <laughs> Good everyone. Welcome to the November 4th, 2014 business meeting of the Washington County Board of Education. We have a quorum of members present. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, before we proceed further, I'd like to invite everybody to stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Are there any guests that board members would like to introduce today? Okay, we'll go on to the approval of the agenda. Mr. President, I move to approve the draft agenda as recommended by the Agenda Committee. Is I'll there se second. Motion by Mrs. Brightman, seconded by Mrs. Fisher. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor of approving the agenda? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Approval of minutes? Mr. President, move for the adoption of minutes from work session held on October the 21st 2014 also minutes from our closed session same date and the business meeting also on the same date Is there a second second motion by mr. Bailey to approve the minutes is there any discussion or any corrections to the minutes if not all those in favor of approval are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Nobody has signed up to speak during public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to? If there is, we can certainly suspend the policy to ensure that you have the opportunity to speak. Okay, we'll move on to old business. First item under, new, under old business is the second reading of the F section policies. Mr. Trot. Good afternoon. During the Board of Education's public business meeting conducted on October the 21st, it considered several changes to the facilities section of the policy manual and it took the following action. It approved the rescission of 13 policies and two exhibits. It approved the revision, revisions to five policies and it approve the recodification of two policies. Since the first reading, these matters were posted and members of the community were provided with an opportunity to provide comments. We did not receive any comments with regard to the proposed changes to these policies. The policy committee is requesting that the Board of Education approve the second reading of these policies and the two exhibits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move to rescind the following policies and exhibits, FAA, FB, FBA, FBB, FE, FEA, 
FEA Exhibit 1, FEA Exhibit 2, FEC, FECA, FECD, FEF, FJ, FL, and FLA. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mr. F Mrs. Fisher to rescind F section policies. Is there any discussion or any amendments? If not, the question is on the approval of Mrs. Fisher's motion. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Is there another motion? Yes, I move to revise the following policies as recommended by the board. FA, FEB, FEDA, FF, and FFB. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, second by Mrs. Brightman to revise five policies. Is there any discussion or any amendments? Just to uh, Mrs. Fisher, uh, Indicated by the, recommended by the board, the the policies did go by the oh. uh, facilities committee and were recommended uh, for uh, re recommended to the policy committee. Yes, this is about two years worth of work that's gone into getting us to this point, <laughs> and that's yeah. uh, thanks to the work of the facilities committee, the policy committee, and a lot of work from staff. So oh. thanks to everyone for all you've done to get us to this point. Is there any further discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Fisher's motion to revise the five policies. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Next, I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy FC entitled Facilities Capitalization Program, Capitalization Limit, and to recodify it as policy DIG entitled Capitalization Program slash Limit which is to be relocated to Section D, Physical Management of the Policy Manual. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, seconded by Mr. Bailey regarding Policy FC. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor of approval? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. And finally, I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy FEI entitled Records Retention and Disposition and to recodify it as policy EHB, which is to be relocated to Section E, Support Services of the Policy Manual. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, seconded by Mrs. Williams regarding policy FEI. Is there any discussion or any amendments? Mrs. Williams? Yes. Um, Number one, purpose. I, I think we're doing more here than just providing the staff with information. I think what we're doing is establishing procedures for the disposition of the school system's records. So I would like to offer an amendment to change the wording of the purpose to the purpose of policy EHB is to establish procedures for the retention and distribution and disposition of the school system's records. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second for purpose of discussion. Second by Mrs. Brightman. Yeah. Mrs. Williams, you have the right to speak first to your amendment. Okay, well, again, I just think that we're doing more than providing staff with uh, information. I think what we have here in the policy statement and procedures are the, um, the procedures for um, the retention and disposition of the system's records. So that's why I'm suggesting that rewording. Is there any other discussion? Was this discussed in policy committee? I'm trying to get a sense of this change. Mrs. Fisher, any? I, I'm not positive. I thought we discussed this and decided that this was not really procedures, but I seem to have failed to have brought that 
policy with my notes on it. So, Mr. Tronda, do you recall the conversation? Um, I, I don't recall any particular conversation. I think Mrs. Williams, I mean, she's a member of the committee, so mm -hmm. she may, it may have been something that was discussed. I, I just don't recall. No, I, I don't recall discussion. This is just something that I noticed in After preparing the for the meeting that, well, this is just first read. We can certainly discuss it. And our next policy. This is actually second this read. Second read. Oh, this one's a second. Yeah, these are the, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, they're all second reads. Yes. And I, and I think that during during the um, one of the motions, it did indi you did indicate it was a first read, but these are both. This is a second read. It's written here. As it's first. written as first. Yeah, it's I, I know it should it should be second. I want to hear the motion again. Mr. Right now, Mr. President, could I have the motion read again, please? And the spot to, to Mr. Trotter where it is. Right. Th this would be new policy EHB in the purpose clause. The purpose of policy EHB is to establish procedures for the re retention and disposition of records. Is that re correct, Mrs. Williams? That's what I had in my notes. Mrs. Williams, does that restate your your amendment correctly? I'm sorry, I was just listening for the motion and I wasn't thinking that you, that was including the, the amendment. Yeah, uh, 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 the purpose of policy EHB is to establish procedures for the retention and disposition of records. Yes. Again, for me, it just puts a little, it puts a finer point on what this is, I think. Clearly, if you look at the, the policy statement and procedures, it, it states what the records shall, what shall happen to those, and what must be done with them. So I think it's, it goes beyond providing staff with information about records. It's clearly stating this is the procedure for handling the records of the system. Is there any further discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Williams' amendment to policy EHB. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. That brings us back to the original motion. And I just want to make clear so everybody understands this is the second read, mm -hmm. even though it was stated as first. If anybody would prefer that we take a step back, defeat this, and then remove it as a second read, we can do that. But I I think everybody understands that this is the second read. So unless there's somebody who'd like us to do that, we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed with everybody understanding exactly what we're voting on. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is there any further discussion? If not, the question's on Mrs. Fisher's motion to approve policy EHB on second read. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. And just following up on the previous discussion, I think she said second read on the third motion is, or first read on the sec, on the third motion as well. If anybody would like us to go and reconsider that so that we're sure that it's second read, or if anybody misunderstood what the vote was, please let's speak up so we're, we can be sure everybody is in agreement on exactly what the vote was that was taken. Everybody's clear, second read? Okay, excellent. We'll move on then. Thank you very much. Second item under old business is the consideration of the second read of changes to policy IHBH. Thank you. The Board of Education approved the first reading of the proposed changes to policy IHBH, which concerns charter schools, at its public business meeting conducted on October the 21st. Since the first reading, the members of the community were provided with an opportunity to provide comments. We did not receive any comments on the proposed changes. The policy committee is requesting the Board of Education's approval of the second reading of the proposed changes to this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the second reading of revised policy IHBH entitled Public Charter Schools. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, seconded by Mrs. Williams to approve the second read of policy IHBH. Is there any discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Fisher's motion to approve policy IHBH. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. 
That brings us to the first item under new business, which is consideration of a gift to Old Forge Elementary School. <coughs> Mr. Semler. Good afternoon, Dr. Hardings, Dr. Wilcox, members of the board. Uh, today I am seeking your approval of the gift in the amount of $6,000 from the Old Forge PTA to Old Forge Elementary School. The gift will be used to support student field trips and extracurricular activities to enhance academic experiences for all students at Old Forge. Thank you, Mr. Semler. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve a gift to Old Forge Elementary in the amount of $6,000 from Old Forge Elementary PTA. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Brightman, seconded by Mr. Bailey to accept the gift. Is there any discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Brightman's motion to accept the gift. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Thank you. Thank you. Second item under new business is the consent agenda. Ms. Freeman? Good afternoon, Dr. Hardings, Dr. Wilcox, and members of the board. Uh, nine procurement items are on your agenda this afternoon. I'm going to give a quick overview of each of those and then um, open the floor for questions that you may have. The first item is a cargo van for the maintenance and operations department. This is a replacement vehicle. Um, the vendor is American Truck and Bus and the total cost is $41,530.72. Item two is a software renewal. This is um, software that is used for our, to manage our server, uh, servers here at the uh, central office and other locations as well. The vendor is CDW Government and the total is $25,999. <coughs> the board has seen several um, purchases recently for similar software and they are unique purchases. So this would be the third of our uh, 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 software renewals for the year and um, the next time you see this uh, purchase it'll be a, a combined of those three software uh, orders into a single order next year. Um, the third item on the agenda is security system upgrade at Rockland Woods Elementary School. The total of this order is $27,992. The vendor is Atlantic Security System and the prices are from um, the bid that the board uh, authorized for renewal last uh, summer. Items four and five on the agenda are bids for school buses. These bids were issued by the purchasing office. Um, we had a public bid opening on October 23rd. They were handled as separate solicitations, but they were uh, <coughs> concurrently um, managed. All of these buses have diesel engines. The 12 row buses <coughs> seat 70 riders. The wheelchair lift buses seat 42 passengers and three wheelchair riders. A purchase order would be issued to the vendor by November 30th and delivery of the buses would be between April 1 and May 31 of 2015. Um, we were pleased to see that our prices for com compared to um, the most recent bid were very favorable and as a result the recommendation is to purchase 11 of the uh, 12 row buses with option D which is the global positioning system as an additional option and five of the wheelchair lift buses with air conditioning as well as the GPS system and um, the collective total of those um, bus orders is one million five hundred and twenty thousand two hundred ninety dollars <throat> sixth on the agenda this afternoon is a request for proposal to establish a contract with a qualified, experienced, and reliable firm to provide us with software and services for filing of claims for Medicaid eligible expenses by students with disabilities. Um, the, uh, this, uh, these files have been, uh, the, the Special Education Department has been handling these claims and is uh, excited to uh, obtain a more sophisticated piece of software that will hopefully um, provide some efficiencies that will increase the revenues that we're able to return to the school district through these uh, uh, Medicaid claims. 
The contract would be effective from the date of award through October of 2015, and it includes options for renewal. The first year cost for the software is $33,000. Annually um, thereafter, we're looking at an expense of $36,000. If we were to renew the contract for four out years, the total expense to the school system would be $177,000. Item 7, the Food and Nutrition Services Department is requesting to utilize this contract with Tyson Sales in distributing and Montgomery County Public Schools for securing uh, good prices um, for the delivery, type of delivery that is, uh, is needed for these chicken products. The total of purchases under this unit price contract is estimated not to exceed $225,000 um, over the uh, course of the rest of the school year. Item 8, the board authorized at the last board meeting the purchase of 1,020 wireless access points to be installed in our schools for increased speed and improved access to the networks. This order is the uh, cabling and wiring services to install 802 of those new Arrowhive access points. Additionally, the vendor will remove and reinstall 252 of the Xeris access units and provide, of course, the associated hardware and uh, supplies that are needed to accomplish that. High performance cabling has performed numerous projects for Washington County Public Schools in the past and they are the contract holder with Hagerstown Community College, which is the vehicle we're recommending for this purchase. The total price is $150,000. <clears> uh, the last item on procurement this afternoon is the purchase of 50 tables and 50 chairs to be used in professional development areas throughout the school system. That order is $35,994. Concludes my summary comments. If you have any questions, is there a motion, Mr. President? I would like to move for the adoption of the nine uh, projects that uh, have just been discussed, and read the motion into the record to approve the bid and requisitions for the purchase of a cargo van for the maintenance and operations department from America. American Truck and Bus at $41,530.72. Renew ACAD VMW uh, uh, Ware uh, Software from CDW uh, Government at $25,999. Security System Upgrade at Rockland Woods Elementary School to Atlantic Security System at $27,992. Purchase 11 12 row and five wheelchair lift buses from American Bus Sales at $1,520,290. Medicaid claims processing software from CompuClaim at $33,000. Processed chicken from Tyson Sales and distributing at unit prices not to exceed. $225,000. Installation of wireless equipment to high performance cabling at $150,000. And tables and chairs for professional development to hyperspace at $35,994. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mr. Bailey for the approval of the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Questions for staff, Mrs. Brighton. Um, question on four and five: the school buses. Um, where are we on the school bus replacement plan? Does this keep us updated? Are we a little behind, a little ahead? I haven't seen the plan recently. Right. A number of years ago, we shared with the board uh, a plan we had to continue to replace approximately 15 buses a year. We do have an out year, it's still several years away, where the board at one time didn't replace any buses or didn't purchase any buses. Right. So we have a year that we anticipate will be an opportunity to pick up 15 growth buses. 
So currently, uh, staff made a decision last year to hold seven of our buses over for a 13th year, and we had to do some additional work to those buses and meet some state requirements. We anticipate that we'll probably keep them maybe for a 14th year or part of the 16 buses being considered here to be replaced, see if any of those are in better shape or will require less maintenance for the long term to hold for two additional years. So our plan is to, to uh, be able to continue to grow, expand routes, do what we need to do for our various services that we provide children to get to that year when we get the 15 growth buses. And the waivers had to go through the state, anything yes. over 12-year bus? All right, thank you. That, that requires retrofitting the bus? Mike could share specifically, but there's specific things we need to do to the bus, several thousand dollars worth, and that's why it might be because we've already invested that in our 13th year of the bus, we might keep some of the seven that we already and made that investment in for 14th year. And uh, the fleet overall, uh, are the buses the majority air conditioned? Uh, the majority would not be air conditioned. Would not be. Okay. And how about containing GPSs? We have Zonar GPS uh, phone system, which we're in the process of going to have to update because our current phone system will become obsolete very soon. But all that, uh, our Zonar, we have a tracking system. We can see the buses, cameras on all buses, including contractor buses, Zonar on contractor buses as well. Thank you. Back to a bus question, it just occurred to me. Um, a constituent asked about the white light on top of the bus and that the original purpose for that was for fog, that it would only run during periods of fog and that somehow that light, if you're sitting behind the bus and hopefully not going past it when you shouldn't, um, when it stopped, that you can, uh, it causes some people to have some visual <coughs> problems with that white. Do you know? I've heard what that before. I've yes. heard a bar for a specific answer on whether the light should always be on or not. Because I've seen it on without fog being present, so that's, Certainly I was curious. We start out in the morning with dark and everything else, it is pretty good to help pick up the bus. And it doesn't seem like we can have possibly have enough lights or or whatever on the bus, but I don't know if Barb has any other specific information about the strobe light or not. But it would be turned off at some point, I assume, as the sun comes up. The um, strobe light is what you're referring yes, to. That and clear the white. strobe light is for any time there's inclement weather or any kind of um, reduction in visibility so that the, the attention can be drawn to the bus. We've had the same concerns brought to our attention, okay. and we have researched that. And the distance and the amount of the strobe is really, um, there's not a lot of substantiation for that strobe light to create a seizure for a person in a vehicle. Um, we've looked into it from several different aspects and through the state, Maryland State Department of Education and through the vendors and um, we're not finding a lot to substantiate that. But we do try to encourage, there's a switch that can turn them off and we do want them on any time there's a reduction in visibility. Great, good answer, thank you. Is there any other discussion? Not the questions on Mr. Bailey's motion to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes seven to zero and the student member concurs. Thank, thank you. you. Item three under new business is consideration of the first read of revised policy KLB, public complaints about the curriculum or instructional materials. Mr. Trotta. Good afternoon. As part of the policy committee's systematic review of the policy manual, it conducted a review of policy KLB which is entitled Public Complaints About the Curriculum or Instructional Materials. It also reviewed the exhibit to this particular policy. The Policy Committee also examined Frederick County's policy on this subject, and over a period of four work sessions of the Policy Committee, it examined this particular policy and studied it at each of those uh, public uh, sessions. The Policy Committee is offering the following recommendations. First, that the policy be relabeled as policy KEC, that the title of the policy be reworded as follows, concerns about instructional resources, 
that the term instructional resources be defined, and finally, that the process that an individual is to follow if they have a concern uh, is to be or should be streamlined. I just wanted to provide you with a brief overview of this policy. The policy encourages any concerns that might arise to be resolved at the school level. If it cannot be resolved at that level, the matter would then be referred to the chief academic officer, and this chief academic, academic officer would have two options. The first is to refer it to the superintendent for a decision, or it could be referred to a committee that would then offer a recommendation that would be submitted to the superintendent. The policy describes the composition of the committee, the timelines for addressing a concern, and the appeal process. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the changes to this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the first reading to rescind policy KLB entitled Public Complaints About the Curriculum or Instructional Materials and exhibits KLB-E entitled Request for Reconsideration of Media and Citizens' Request for Reconsideration of Work. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, second by, my, by Mrs. Williams to approve the first read of policy KLB. Is there any discussion? I was the one who reviewed this when we went through our normal process in the policy committee, and I will just point out that the last time this policy was updated was 1979. Ooh. So um, <laughs> I'm this glad is we can. Does it take the award for the oldest? I think it's the oldest one I've seen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's way back. And, and I'll just say personally, I originally thought I would vote against this because it seems to me that this could be reviewed. That, complaints about the curriculum could be addressed through all the other processes we have to address complaints from constituents and parents, but uh, the, my colleagues on the policy committee who have been involved in the instructional side of the school system, uh, I think make a very good case that these particular issues should be handled separately, so uh, I, will, I will defer to their judgment and, and be glad to support the policy. Is there any further discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Fisher's motion to approve the first read of policy KLB. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Thank you. Item 4 under new business is consideration uh, of the. Wait, oops. wait, wait. Another Got another motion. Is there one. another motion? <laughs> okay. Mr. President, I move to approve the first reading of proposed policy KEC entitled Concerns About Instructional Resources and pr proposed exhibit KEC-E entitled Request for Consideration of Instructional Resource. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, seconded by Mrs. Williams. Is there any discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Fisher's motion to approve policy K, approve the first reading of proposed policy KEC. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0, and the student member concurs. Now we'll move on to <laughs> item 4 under new business, which is the first read of proposed policy GBEC, Drug Free Workplace. Thank you. The Human Resources Committee prepared a new policy and it submitted it to the Policy Committee for its consideration. This proposed policy states very clearly that it is the expectation of the Board of Education that the workplace, workplace is to be drug free. The Policy Committee endorsed the recommendations of the Human Resources Committee and offered minor changes. The Policy Committee also recommended that a, that a definition section be added to the policy. We're requesting the Board of Education's approval of the first reading of policy GBEC. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes, Mr. President. I move to approve the first reading to adopt proposed policy GBEC entitled Drug Free Workplace. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mrs. Fisher, seconded by Mrs. Williams to approve policy GBEC. Is there any discussion? Not the questions on Mrs. Fisher's motion to approve policy <coughs> GBEC. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. The student member concurs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotta. 
Item 5 under new business is the first quarter FY15 budget adjustments. Mr. South. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Mr. Superintendent, members of the board. We provided the board members with a listing of the requested first quarter fiscal year 2015 budget adjustments in the packet that they received uh, on Friday. I believe that these uh, um, requested adjustments are fairly straightforward. However, there are just a couple of high dollar uh, items I would like to bring to your attention. First of all, on line four, the student transportation services were requesting a reduction in the budget of $147,400. That's based on a, the current run rates uh, for contracted driver uh, costs, uh, which are uh, uh, budgeted about $120,000 uh, higher than expect, uh, expected uh, final cost, and uh, insurance costs uh, approximately $27,000 lower than what we had budgeted. If you move down to line five, operation of plant, there we're request, requesting an increase of nearly $278,000. We're requesting a move of, of $250,000 uh, to technology equipment for uh, uh, replacement of uh, the wireless network to assist in that project. And additionally, uh, uh, property and casualty insurance is going to increase by about $27,000 this year a large part of which is due to the addition of this particular facility that we're in right now to our, to our coverage uh, and also a, a small amount to the general trends in the insurance market. Finally, on line six, fixed charges, we're uh, requesting to lower that budget by $100,000 due to lower participation uh, over the last several years uh, in the 457B perfect attendance uh, cash out benefit. All of the changes put together bring us to a, a net change of zero to the fund balance. And at this time, uh, we re I res respectfully request your approval of these changes. And of course, we'd be glad to answer any questions that the board members may have. Thank you, Mr. South. Is there a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the first reading. Oops, I'm sorry. I've lost it. <laughs> Excuse me. Mr. President, I move to approve the FY 2015 first quarter budget adjustment. Is there a second? Second, Mr. President. Motion by Mrs. Williams, seconded by Mr. Bailey to approve the first quarter budget adjustments. Is there any discussion? I, just Mrs. to Williams. clarify, Mr. Southey, first uh, line item under administration. That amount will show up on each of the quarterly budget adjustments. Is that correct, that, that we've taken that total amount to? I, I, yes, ma'am. At this, at this particular time, the, the $30,000 that you see there is just the cost for the first quarter. Okay. So for that we'll particular see that. individual. We should see that for each of the remaining three yes, quarters. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. If, if it's not filled. If it's not filled, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is there any other discussion, any further questions? If not, the questions on Mrs. Williams' motion to approve the budget adjustments. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0, and the student member concurs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. South. Sixth item under new business is the adoption of the legislative priorities for the 2015 Maryland legislative session. As you all will recall, we had a work session on October 21st, uh, whose minutes we approved earlier in this meeting, at which we discussed the board's, board's legislative priorities with Ms. Cade um, and the members of the board in order to develop our priorities for the upcoming legislative session. At the time, we wanted to ensure that there was uh, sufficient time and detail put into the notes that came out of that discussion so that before the board actually voted on it, we could see a final copy of what those legislative priorities looked like since we did make some changes uh, versus the 2014 legislative priorities. The new priorities have been provided to all members. Uh, they're available on door board docs for members of the public to see. And right now I will seek a motion to approve the 2015 legislative priorities. 
Mr. President, I move to approve the legislative priorities for state and federal legislation as discussed at the work session. Is there a second? Second, Mr. President. Motion by Mrs. Brightman, seconded by Mr. Reidenauer to approve the priorities. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Brightman? Um, the only change I would suggest or request would be on page five at the bottom last paragraph where we use the terminology quick response team. I think we have abandoned that and have picked up the legislative response team and would ask that that be super changed corrected. over to that corrected. Thank you. Is there any objection to making that change? Okay. Any other discussion? Great. So with this vote, this will complete our initial part of the process regarding our new legislative policy, which includes four parts. One is establishing core values, which the board's adopted. Uh, second is appointing members of a legislative response team, which the board did at our last meeting. The third is, is, is approving a legislative liaison, which we did at the last meeting as Ms. Cade. And this is the final part of that process, which is establishing the specific priorities. Um, one thing I'll just add, and I'm not sure, I'm not recommending that we add this to our priorities right now, but we do have a request pending with the Attorney General regarding contract language for superintendents. If that comes back in a way that's, well, regardless of how it comes back, we will probably want to take a look at whether we want to establish some sort of legislative priority relating to that particular topic. Um, regardless of what the Attorney General says, there's going to be an opportunity for us to to look at whether we'd like to recommend changes to state law. So while we won't do that today, I don't think um, we should be mindful of it as we move forward. Any other discussion? If not, the question is on Mrs. Brightman's motion to approve the legislative priorities for the 2015 legislative session. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0, and the student member concurs. <coughs> that brings us to the superintendent's report. Thank you. It's my privilege today to ask our Chief Academic Officer um, and uh, Dr. Angela Domain and our Director for Secondary Education to come forward, as well as our Supervisor for Testing and Accountability, Marie McGarvich, to come forward. And they're going to talk to the board and to the larger community about our ACT and SAT results. Good afternoon, Dr. Hardings, Vice President Brightman and other members of the board and Superintendent Wilcox, we are here to share the 2014 ACT and SAT results for, uh, with you. We want you to know, first of all, um, dealing with the ACT, we have only about 10% of our students who take the uh, ACT. We believe that this is due to the fact that traditionally, Maryland schools have required the SAT and our schools have then geared uh, their focus towards providing students opportunities to participate in the PSAT. So we're, we're primarily an, an SAT uh, district. So again, only about 10%, and that has been consistent throughout the years, as you can see. 10% um, of our students participate in the ACT. In Maryland, uh, there's a significantly higher number of students across the state that take the, the uh, ACT. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have found in the results for this year is that uh, there has been a slight decline in this, the performance of our students on the ACT. Um, beginning with English, our composite score in English declined slightly by 1.8 points uh, from last year to this year to 18.9. We saw a similar trend in mathematics. Again, slight decrease of 1.2 points from 22.1 to 20.9. Um, even though this score is equal to the mean score for all schools in the nation, but it is a decline for us. Similar uh, occurrence in reading, slight decline from last year to, uh, to this year. 
in reading from 21.8 to 20.3. And again in science, like decline, 1.5 points from 22.0 in 2013 to 20.5 in 2014. With these declines then, that means that our composite score also took a hit. It was down uh, 1.5 points from 21.8 in 2013 to 20.3 uh, this past administration. Again, we know that our, our children focus on, on the SAT, um, and you'll see that our results are, are better uh, in that area. Um, Rick, would you like to add anything about the ACT? Uh, the only thing I would add is that it, it's um, specific schools. Uh, if students are applying uh, to specific schools that request them to take the ACT, uh, those students take it and then also students who uh, want to take a college uh, entrance exam of some kind but uh, their counselor feels they have not really prepared themselves to take the SAT based on the PSAT sometimes they're recommended to take the ACT uh, to see if they can measure a strength for example in science that they haven't demonstrated in in a math or English class um, we we counsel students uh, a great deal on their college plans based on how they score on the PSAT in the 10th grade and then also in the 11th grade. Um, just feeling that it does not work in a student's best interest if they have a significantly low SAT score, um, that they're better taking different kinds of information uh, or, or putting different kinds of information on their college application to put their best foot forward. So I think it's it, also important to note in this that when you take a look at the ACT scores for the 2013 cohort of students, we have <coughs> almost 40 more kids out of a, uh, an overall number of only uh, 180 kids. Um, so our, our, I, I don't want the board to put too much stock in the fact because 40 kids who are being counseled to take this test because they perhaps didn't score well enough on the SAT could clearly skew the composite averages um, because the the overall number of students taking the test just isn't that significant. Um, typically we average about 130 to 140 kids across the system out of all seven comprehensive high schools taking the ACT. Those are primarily kids that are going to go to Midwestern schools or perhaps even looking to matriculate to college or university in Texas or uh, the, the southwest where the SAT is not as prevalent as the ACT. The other thing that Mr. Akers was I think alluding to is that when you take the SAT test it is a very different type of test than the, uh, than the ACT. The ACT test does not punish you for guessing if you will on the test where the SAT in fact does. So you know I won't get into the SAT results right now but I did want to point out to the board that the norm has the, the norm has the, the denominator has changed, and it's important for. I don't know why I'm having a hard time with that, but in, in any event, we have more kids <laughs> taking it. I think that's actually a positive in the sense that our guidance counselors are trying to find other ways to get kids into school who may not have had the SAT score that was going to help them. And, and question statewide ACT test takers that has increased consistently over the years. Are we? It, does that say that more students from Maryland are going to the Southwest or I mean is there something else going on there as to why it seems on a state level they've always had more ACT test takers than we have? I, I don't know that I can speak to that. I don't know that we have data that would say that. My guess and I could certainly find out but my guess is that as you get closer to uh, Baltimore DC that some of the bigger counties probably have more students who are going to go greater distances in order to go to college um, and so okay. there probably is a higher number of students taking the ACT in those bigger counties but that again I, I could confirm that for you okay thank you <clears throat> SAT I, I oh, a question. I'm sorry, sorry this is perfect um, so, so what uh, you were saying is that just this past year, more students were encouraged to take that. Is that because the drop was from 
2013 to 2014. I'm sorry, my voice is not so good. So not that more students were encouraged to take it. On average, about 10% of our students take the ACT. I mean, we had fewer students who took it <coughs> this year as, com as compared to 2013. Fewer students? Fewer. So they had been encouraged before to take it, or? I'm not understanding the explanation for the drop. I'm sorry. Well, I think uh, what Dr. Wilcox mentioned was that it's a smaller portion of the population, and so when you look at the significance and the fluctuation of the score, it could just be reflected in a smaller sample size as opposed to any change in instruction or anything of that nature. Okay. Thank you. I'd also like to add that I have learned that in 2015, the way that ACT scores or reports the, the scores on the test will change. Their scoring, even though the, the range won't change 1 to 36, they will work to more towards reflecting college and career readiness. So for example, there'll be a STEM score. There will be a uh, college um, readiness indicator as well, a career ready readiness indicator as well. So that may impact um, the number of students who take it as well. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Bailey. Um, the comment was made that the number taking the ACT might have been increased because counselors urged them to do this because their SATs weren't all that good. Is that a correct statement? Uh, their PSAT. The PSAT. Yeah, it's it's uh, preliminary good. SAT tests. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering if there would be any <coughs> value in establishing a correlation between one who takes the ACT and the SAT to look at a correlation of those. I would say it, it's going to be interesting, especially as it's adjusted to reflect uh, more uh, curricula that has been developed on the framework of the Common Core. For, for example, Maryland's uh, College Career Ready Standards, um, Not as we'll hear when we look at the SAT, um, that test is going to be changed significantly uh, in for the spring of 2016. So the adjustments that uh, Dr. Domain mentioned for 2015 in the scoring of the ACT uh, is going to be reflected probably even more uh, on the, the uh, SAT in 2016. So at that point, I think they're going to come closer to measuring the same thing. So by, I think by the time we could do that study, there's going to be significant change. Yeah, change in the test. Okay. Thank you for your professional information. All right, um, moving to the SAT, as Dr. Wilcox pointed out, it is a very different test than the ACT. Uh, the SAT is an aptitude test. It, it tests reasoning and verbal abilities. Our participation in the SAT has been strong. It has been, it has remained consistent. Again, you can see we're at uh, right at 54% 2013 and 2014. Most of our students take uh, the SAT. Our scores in critical reading um, was 493. It was 493 in 2014. This score uh, has remained consistent from 2013. We did outscore all Maryland public schools, um, the national mean for uh, all public schools and uh, all schools in Maryland. This score represents between um, represents our students scoring above 48 to 51 percent of all test takers. We're in the 48th to 51st percentile. This score represents that. In mathematics,
with a score of 508, uh, which is a, a slight decrease from 2013. Again, um, is still higher than our, our other subgroups that we're looking at. We have still outscored on Maryland public schools. It's it's above the national mean for public schools and uh, all schools in Maryland coming within five points of the national uh, average. The score of 508 places our scores uh, at the between the 45th and the 49th percentile. So uh, I believe our students remain competitive. In the area of writing, the 2014 score was 478. It is six points lower than uh, we did in 2013. However, this score has us placed between the 44th and the 48th percentile. And then finally, our composite score. Um, in the composite score, there is a slight decline, but again, we still outscore all Maryland public schools, um, the mean for all public schools in the nation, and all schools in Maryland, public and private as well. Um, and after looking at this data, we simply look to see how how do we respond, what, what more is it that we can do to support our students uh, as they continue to take the SAT and demonstrate their college and career readiness. Um, Ms. Draker has already referred to the redesign that is coming in the SAT. It will reflect um, our Maryland college career uh, ready standards, will be reflective of those standards. And so we have um, at the district level, we've been trying to implement um, systematically those standards. There are some specific school-based actions that are taking place as well to support uh, students as they uh, encounter that curriculum. Rick? Yeah, and because this year's juniors and seniors will be taking the, the current uh, SAT as far as uh, as applies to their applications to colleges uh, so we continue to use our current uh, SAT curriculum materials primarily warm-up materials and things in math and in ELA classes um, we also offer a college prep class that has embedded in it SAT prep uh, we are currently posting for we're trying to get a countywide Saturday SAT prep course uh, in the first round uh, I may have made the day too long for people because uh, we didn't get a lot of applications so we're going to make some adjustments to that and, and repost uh, but some schools already uh, run their own uh, for, for their students their Saturday preps uh, but we wanted to uh, we want to offer uh, one countywide this year uh, that students from any school could go to so we continue to work on that um, and then at the same time as Dr. Domain mentioned, our, the curriculum work that we're doing, uh, unlike in the past, is going to be directly aligned to what kids are going to be asked to do uh, on the SAT. So I think that's going to make it uh, a far uh, better uh, route than simply trying to teach test taking <coughs> skills and strategies uh, because because what the SAT measures especially in terms of vocabulary and those kind of things can't really be taught in a short period of time uh, you can certainly help people put their best foot forward on the SAT and not do things to undermine their score uh, and you know but those are test taking skills that don't necessarily reflect real learning uh, with the new SAT I think uh, everyone's going to feel better about the fact that by just doing a better job of teaching and learning in English and math our students will be able to do better on the SAT Are there any questions I just have one quickly maybe you can help clarify I'm not sure I understood correctly so for example the SAT math results I think 
Dr. Domain, you said that puts us in the 45th to 49th percentile? 40, from between the 45th and 49th percentile, yes. But if our scores are 20 points <laughs> above Maryland public schools, seven points above all of the nation's public schools, 13 points above Maryland all, pub, all schools, and only five points below the nation's all schools, it seems like we should be higher than 49th. SAT provides a, um, they provide a, 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 a ranking of their scores. And so they will tell you if you score, and, and the score range differs for each test that you take. And they tell you that if you have this specific score, you are at this specific percentile. Okay. And I'll, I'll share the, the chart with you if, if you like. Yeah, I mean, that, that might help. I just, okay. It seems like if we're above everybody else, but we're yet below 50%, that uh, I just, unless there's a whole lot of kids in the nation that don't go to any public schools, and, you know, there's some states where there are a lot. But I, I could be wrong, but I think it, if, if it's ranking the school district, then it may be skewed by the size of a school district. But that's okay. the only thing I could think of that okay. would cause that mathematical anomaly to occur. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Are there other questions? Mrs. Brightman. Yeah, back to the ACTSAT question. Um, my understanding on the SAT redesign, at least the rumor is, that it was driven by the increasing market share that ACT was gaining and that SAT was trying to respond to loss of market share. And I get profit margins and I understand all of that. I guess what I'm asking you as a Board of Ed member, as a parent, should there be a choice here? If SAT is becoming more like ACT, where, where do we know what guidance to give our children, our students, as a counselor or parent? I think we have to work on that test of best fit. Um, again, there, there are two very different tests. If you even read the questions, read a question from the ACT, in my opinion, it's, it's more direct. It's more achievement oriented. You know, did you learn this in school? Uh, those kinds of questions. Um, the ACT, uh, I'm sorry, the SAT appears to be more perceptual, uh, conceptual, I'm sorry. Uh, students have to really think, I think, more deeply about how they respond. It's more of applying and synthesizing what you've learned as opposed to, um, again, just a mere measurement of facts and skills that you have acquired in a classroom. So again, that's why I think you, there, there are some students who do very well on one and not the other. And so we simply need to find the test of best fit. It isn't that one is better than the other or more preferred than the other. Uh, I th think we simply need to find the one that is best suited for, um, for the student, the individual student. But that's also, and it's also driven by the college choices of the individual, yes. right? And but, so. But if they're redesigning the SAT to be more like the ACT, is there truly going to be a difference after 2016, 17, which is where I'm going with this? Well, and that will be up to, I, I think, you know, ultimately, we're not the consumer in this. The, it's going to be driven by the colleges and universities yes. who say, this is the test that we want our kids to demonstrate. So our job will be to help shape kids in the sense that they know what they're good at and know the kinds of things they might chase in their later life. And then they will pick a college or university that matches up with that. And then we can help them with doing well on whichever test that college or university requires. What's interesting to me is there are a significant number of schools right now that are moving away from any standardized test. Exactly. That's uh, the third so, option. So, um, you know, that's something that we're keeping our eyes on, at least administratively here in this building, um, taking a look at the number of, of really great schools that are saying, we're not going to put our stock in that. We're going to take a look at your entire body of work. We're going to take a look at the classes you took, your volunteerism. We're going to take a look at the activities that you participate in. We're going to take a look at the references that you have, which is kind of a, a shift 
um, from some schools. Now, we don't have a lot of the tier one universities doing that yet, but we have a lot of private liberal arts schools who are doing that. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, your commercial aspect of your right. inquiry, I, I would say that <clears throat> the College Board has partnered uh, with Khan Academy, and they're actually going to be providing free online uh, test prep uh, through the Khan Academy. So whether that's out of the kindness of their hearts or a way of capturing more test takers, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I would think one way over the other. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is personnel action. Ms. Francisco. Dr. Hardings, Dr. Wilcox, members of the board, as discussed earlier today in closed session, there are several personnel actions for your review and approval today. Is there a motion to approve the personnel actions recommended by staff? Mr. President, I move for the adoption of recommendations made by staff for personnel. There's a second. Is there any discussion? If not, the question is on Mr. Bailey's motion to approve the personnel actions recommended by staff. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? The motion passes 7 to 0, and the student member abstains. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to reports to the board. The 2014-2015 official student enrollment and free and reduced meal eligibility rates. August looking group. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Hardings, uh, Dr. Wilcox, members of the board. Uh, today's that one time in the year where we have the opportunity to update you on the official September 30th enrollment as well as the October 31st official free and reduced meal eligibility rates for our students here in Washington County. Both these numbers are important because they drive much of the educational planning, our facilities planning, certainly have budget implications as well. As we look at uh, enrollment changes for this year, after 13 years of growth, we're experiencing our first year in 13 years of a decline in student enrollment. Our K-5 to enrollment dropped 173 students. You can see 10,035 students is our K-5 to enrollment. Uh, largely due to an exiting large fifth grade and a very small, for us right now, a small kindergarten class coming in. She may recall when Deanna Newman was here from Public Pathways, she shared that over the last five years we've had a um, low birth rate in Washington County and it's experienced in other areas as well, possibly contributed to the economy over the last five years. And we're seeing that start to show up in Washington County Public Schools. Our current second grade is fairly large, fairly normal with 1,700 plus students. Our, our first grade dropped to the 1,600s and now our kindergarten has dropped to uh, the 1,500s. So we're seeing that uh, low birth rate show up uh, in our schools as well as what she calls the survivorship is lower than it normally is. When we're growing new housing as well as uh, high birth rates, often we'll see our survivorship rate closer to one. Right now, we're seeing a much lower survivorship rate. Our six through eight total enrollment declined to slightly 35 students. Uh, again, exiting large ninth grade, a little smaller uh, sixth grade moving in. But we're looking at 35 students, less than 1% of that student body. And likewise, in high school, a decline of approximately 11 students. Again, far less than, I think it's about 0.2 of 1%. Uh, so virtually no change to the high school level. Our special centers would be Marshall Street, JDC. Uh, they fluctuate between 70 and 80 students almost year over year. Uh, so our total decline in our K-12, to which is uh, a number that is uh, important to us as far as increase in funding or funding, is approximately 212 students. Uh, the increase we saw this year came from pre-K. As the board's aware, we did receive a grant. Uh, staff applied for and received a grant to expand our pre-K program program. Uh, we believe that that will continue to grow, but right now we're up 44 students over where we were uh, September 30th of last year. So our total student enrollment change pre-K to 12, uh, we're looking at a net decrease of approximately 168 students. As we look at this over time, 
Uh, you can see a number of years ago, we started to decline uh, back in the early uh, leading up to 2000 and then since 2000, 13 years of growth and really a flattening uh, this year with our decline kind of puts us back where we were a couple years ago, 2011, 2012 type number. Chad has taken a great deal of time and looked at our information school by school and has a few comments he'd like to make and then following his comments, uh, Mr. Pru will provide uh, the latest on our farm rates. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Um, so just going through the changes in enrollment, uh, the total pre-K uh, through five enrollment between the elementary facilities between last September and this September, I just want to point out a couple of schools. Um, Looking at Bester Elementary School, as Mr. Michael had mentioned, uh, while most of our elementary facilities are experiencing a decrease in the kindergarten enrollment, we actually saw an increase in enrollment at Bester Elementary this year. Um, it's something we're going to keep an eye on as the years uh, progresses. Uh, and it's, it's actually something that's similar that we've seen happen in other areas that uh, have the same type of demographics. And it would not be unsurprising to see the enrollment at Bester actually start to trail back down as the year progresses uh, as we get to the January, March, and June enrollments back towards a, a more average level uh, that we would typically see. Um, Boonesboro Elementary is down by about 27 students. Uh, this is actually the third year of a decrease in enrollment at Boonesboro Elementary School. Um, it's actually it's the lowest enrollment since 2002. So it's trending back towards its state rated capacity, which is good for that facility. Um, as Mr. Michael had mentioned and is indicated on the slides with an asterisk, uh, Clear Spring, Funkstown, Hickory, and Morgansville Elementary all had changes to the pre-K program between last year and this year, which is identified by the increase in their enrollment from the prior year. Um, two other schools to point out on this slide, uh, Conica Jig and Greenbrier are both down by a little over 20 students. Um, both of these facilities had larger fifth grades exiting and smaller kindergarten classes uh, that came in to enrollment this year. Uh, looking at the balance of the elementary school facilities, I'd like to point out Pangborn Elementary School staying relatively flat. Uh, about two years ago, the Board of Ed approved a uh, bound attendance zone boundary realignment at the recommendation of the Facility Enrollment Advisory Committee. Uh, if you remember, we were projecting enrollment at Pangborn to be up around 800 and 800 plus. So this, this appears to be working and, and is definitely a very positive uh, enrollment that was recorded. Um, looking at Paramount Elementary, Potomac Heights Elementary School, uh, Ruth Ann Monroe Primary School and Williamsport Elementary School. All four of these facilities are down between 20 to 30 students. And again, a lot of this is attributed to the smaller kindergarten classes that came into each of these facilities. Um, Winter Street Elementary School appears to be down by about 31 students, but in actuality, last September, if you remember, we had identified a very large kindergarten class at this facility, and as the year progressed, it came down to a more average enrollment level and got back to the 280, uh, 280-couple range that it typically sees. So while it appears to be down from last year's enrollment, if you would look at the enrollment later in the year, you would see it's actually staying relatively consistent. Our total elementary school enrollment is down 129. And for anyone doing the math on the uh, second slide, if you would take the K through five enrollment, or it was down, and you would add in the pre-K enrollment, the two numbers would add up to a, a net deficit of 129 students uh, across the elementary grades. And looking at the Boons, or the, the middle school enrollment changes, uh, I'd like to point out Boonesboro Elementary School. Of course, I had mentioned. Um, that the elementary school was down, but the middle school is up. Uh, it's actually up due to a uh, larger incoming uh, sixth grade, and the eighth grade that left was actually smaller, and I'll identify that here on the next slide at the high school. Um, e. Russell Hicks is remaining relatively flat. Uh, Northern Middle School saw a little bit smaller sixth grade come in, which caused it to be down by around 24 students this year. And both Springfield and Western Heights uh, saw a little bit larger eighth grade leave and move on to the high school level. So our net total for the middle school grade levels were down about 35 students from where we were last year. Uh, looking at the high school enrollment changes, um, Barbara Ingram, uh, Barbara Ingram is actually at its highest enrollment since the school opened in 2009 at 277 students. Uh, so it's about 30 students higher than where it was last year and it's obviously a good thing for the program. Um, 
Boonesboro High School uh, is down 31 students. Of course, with the middle school, I mentioned the uh, small exiting eighth grade, so this would be a small incoming ninth grade to this facility. And this is actually the lowest enrollment that Boonesboro High has experienced since 1997. So uh, we're seeing that trend down. This is its second year of an enrollment decline, I believe, at that facility. Uh, Clear Spring saw a little bit larger ninth grade class come in. Um, that's going to be a little bit of a bubble that we're going to see work through Clear Spring over the next couple years, but we expect the trailing grades to be back down towards more average levels. Um, North Hagerstown High and South Hagerstown High both saw just a slight decrease of a little over 20 students. And Washington County Technical High School uh, increased by 12 students this year, which is its highest enrollment since 1997. So again, we're seeing both of these facilities help alleviate some of the enrollment pressures at some of our other high school facilities, which is a, a good thing. Uh, Williamsport High is up by not 19 students. So our total high school difference between last year and this year is we're down by about 11 students, but we're definitely seeing some positive, positive things. Um, at the special centers, uh, Marshall Street and the Job Development Center, uh, we're seeing a pretty static <coughs> enrollment, which we, we typically do every year between these two facilities. And now I'll hand it over to Mr. Prue. Thanks, Chad. Um, as you see, we, every year on October 31, we count numbers of students at that juncture who are eligible for free or reduced price meals, and that's submitted to the state for compensatory education funding. What you see this year is a 1% increase uh, over the prior year to our highest level of 49.3%. Uh, in your board packets, you actually have a breakdown of uh, site level uh, information. And what I'll highlight is where we're seeing our largest increases this year are schools that are in the community eligibility provision meal program. As you may recall, all those students receive free meals, but uh, they do fill out what we call the household survey form uh, so that we can calculate what would have been the, elig the actual meal eligibility for those families had they had to purchase their meals. Um, it's a simplified form from the standard free and reduced meal application, uh, and I think we saw large returns on those this year with uh, high numbers of students that were eligible uh, within those schools or would have been eligible had they been in a traditional meal uh, buying program. And I think that's driving the number. Okay, with that, we'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Uh, again, this is the official numbers that are going to the state. <clears throat> You'll see those uh, posted online after they're verified by the state uh, for both enrollment and farm rate. Uh, that'll come up on the Maryland report card probably sometime in the spring for our official enrollment and official free and reduced meal rate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Or is Dr. Michael, is there any discussion from board members? Any questions? Mrs. Brighton? Um, back to the free and reduced meal, that continues to up, go up every, every year. Um, is, now, is this elementary and secondary? It's across the board. So if you pulled out elementary, would we be at 50% just at elementary at this point, do you think? I, I believe that's accurate, yes. Um, and you may not track this separately. Um, from your perspective, but I'm thinking about the number of homeless students. I know earlier this year we were talking in the high 400s, 500. Have we looked at those numbers? Students, yeah, or Jeff, updating. correct me if I'm wrong. If you're declared homeless, you're automatically eligible for free and reduced meals. You like are. So correct. students that are homeless are eligible for free and reduced price meals. So we ensure that those students get benefits. But in terms of the tracking and where those numbers are, I think we have to defer to our student services department. Okay, right. but so we don't know whether that number is continuing to climb, I guess is where I'm... I, I couldn't tell you from my perspective. To break that out. I've not analyzed that specific data. Okay. Um, I just know that was concerning when I heard that number earlier this year. When we look at Hancock um, with a uh, change of 11, down 11 students, what is the status, and again, you may not know this, of the... Um, tuition paying, st paying students from Little Orleans. Do we still have any of those students at Hancock? I would have to confirm with Mr. Gaiman, but to my knowledge, that number is very small at this point, if not zero. Z if not. Uh, some of the students from that area did move into Hancock, Hancock or have um, residents there in Hancock, but I, I don't believe there's a substantial number, if any, that are paying tuition at this time. I, I could be incorrect. So, 
So this isn't that number, possibly, of those students who have couldn't afford to pay tuition and went ahead I and I don't went. think we're seeing that as part of the That's decline. Okay. Uh, I know a number of years ago, Hancock Middle Senior High School had over 400 students. Uh, Chad, I think we looked that up, like, you know, 440. 434. 434. So I think Mr. Bailey will miss points this out every year, kind of at this time, but uh, uh, we continue to see a decline there. I mean, just an absence of housing and, and, and things like that in the Hancock area. Okay. And one other, when we look at the pre-K, I know we had the dollars from the grant money to the Clear Spring, Funkstown, Hickory, and Morgansville, and maybe Dr. Wilcox knows this better, but do we also get additional compensatory aid for those same students? those 44 new students, or is it just the grant money? The funding for pre-K is very different than that K-12 to funding. That's why we break out the K-12 to funding. That's uh, a large part of how our funding formula is built. As I understand it, it's our enrollment increasing or decreasing, mm -hmm. our free and reduced meal rate, I believe our wealth per pupil rate, and then there's a state formula that generates a number or a factor, and then that, of course, is relative then to how all the other counties uh, fared. Uh, even though we had declining enrollment, increase in farm rate, it still could transition into more money. Um, depending upon what happened in other counties, it could transition into less money if other counties grew at a greater rate, grew in farm rate, uh, I guess uh, declined in wealth per pupil. Just a lot of factors go into that. But pre-K is calculated completely different and it's not part of that Because we still get formula. a percentage of state money for the existing pre-K. It's a very small percentage. It's part of that compensatory aid. And I was curious if we were getting that for this new set of... Top of the grant? I, on top of. I, I to defer to Mr. South. Yes, but let me verify that. I just think that's important as we look forward at possibly doing a pilot, pre-K pilot, and, and pre-K becoming more mandated or phasing in, how that funding um, may help us serve these students. Thank you. There are other questions? Mrs. Harshman? I was wondering which of our schools um, were listed as over capacity at this time. At this point in time? Um, currently, now it, it's a little confusing because the numbers we just presented were the total pre-K through five students, so we would have to regenerate those in the full-time equivalent to compare them to their assessed state-rated capacity. But, but in, in simple terms, as of September, uh, we had uh, Boonesboro Elementary, Clear Spring Elementary School, Emma K. Dowb Elementary School, uh, Hickory and Lincolnshire, Pangborn Elementary School, Sharpsburg Elementary School and Williamsport Elementary School at the elementary levels. And then at the uh, high school levels, um, South Hagerstown High and Williamsport High are both uh, just over state rated capacity, along with technically Barbara Ingram School for the Arts, even though uh, we have the, uh, the adjacent educational space is still listed as over state rated capacity because of the, the building capacity. So, What were the last... Um of the um, elementary after Paramount. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, it's uh, <laughs> Sharpsburg Elementary School and Williamsport Elementary School. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. There are other questions. I'll just do a little quick math here, which. One of the reasons, there are many reasons that these enrollment numbers matter, one of which Mrs. Harshman was getting at as we try to figure out how to best utilize our resources. The other, of course, Mrs. Brightman was touching on, which is enrollment numbers are used to determine how much funding we receive from the state and from the county. Um, based on last year, just quick numbers, it looks like we receive about $11,650 or so per student between the state and the county. So if we're down... 212 students this year that would starting out for the formula for next year put us about two and a half million dollars in revenue mm -hmm. behind where we are this year is that roughly correct the, the real dirty math yes okay um, now there's some other things about the formula that, have, that affect 
how much funding we receive. It depends on whether our county gets wealthier or less wealthy as compared to other counties. But just starting from ground zero, we're going to be behind about two hundred, about two and a half million dollars, um, which to me is the big. That's the big news to me here, uh, because that that really affects the way we can plan and and some of the priorities that the superintendents established, that the boards established, and how those priorities might have to be reshuffled as we move forward. I mean, we don't know yet, but um, it's uh, it seems like it's a hole to dig out of to start to start from. Okay. So hopefully that won't materialize come springtime, but uh, um, it's so certainly something I think the board should keep its eye on. Uh, the second thing in, related to, I think, Mrs. Harshman's question about enrollments is as we've met with and as we've discussed the educational facilities master plan and when we had our work session, there was a representative from Boonesboro here. We've had some correspondence from Boonesboro back six, eight months ago about building a new school in Boonesboro and what's the proper phasing, whether Boonesboro comes first or Sharpsburg comes first. Um, we still have another year or two before we need to make a final decision on that, but with Boonesboro's enrollment continuing to decline, that's certainly something that I think we as a board are going to have to take a look at as we, as we make those decisions. Um, and the more we can know whether that's a temporary thing or, I mean, we know that there's construction going on in Boonesboro, and that's going to add students as those homes are permitted and built. The question is whether the rate at which they're being added is greater than the rate at which we're losing students in the Boonesboro area otherwise. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me was not only is Boonesboro down, but, sh but um, Sharpsburg. Greenbrier's down and so is Sharpsburg. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't affect just Boonesboro Elementary. That now is affecting growth and capacity in the middle school and in the high schools for the whole South County region. So as we look at all of this moving forward when we move through our facilities process in the spring, uh, this is going to be very important data for us to look at. And I only say that to highlight it for uh, the sake of the people in Sharpsburg, the sake of the people in Boonesboro who, you know, want newer updated schools. I certainly understand that. Uh, but it's important for all of them to know that this is the kind of data that really drives the decisions that the staff will make and that the board will then have to ultimately make a decision on. So perhaps one other comment just for all of the board members um, and for the community who are listening to this conversation. Um, we have already begun taking a look at what this means for staffing in the coming years. So we are talking internally about positions that we're authorizing or that we have authorized. And I would share with the board, and this might seem a bit counterintuitive, but you'll be getting recommendations for us to increase our pupil teacher ratios, uh, not to increase our ratios, but to increase the number of teachers in this district uh, just in probably in the next two weeks. One of the things that we're seeing in our population numbers is that we have an increased numbers of English language learners, young people who cannot speak the language, they're new to our country, and we have to have um, some people with language skills to help them begin to learn English. So we've authorized the creation of two additional positions beyond those positions that we've already authorized uh, to meet those needs. Another area, we have a young student who has uh, incredibly fragile medical conditions. We can't be without nurse nursing staff for this and the student is not able to be served by the current nursing facilities that we have on campus because she requires constant care. So you know it may seem counterintuitive but we want you as a board to know that as a staff we're being very thoughtful about where we're adding and where we're getting the money from and we'll be able to share specifically you dollar for dollar where we're making budget reallocations in order to accomplish these kinds of tasks. Our, our job is not easy going forward, um, particularly when you see the kinds of numbers that Dr. Hardings is talking and the uncertainty of how our free and reduced lunch rate will play into that. Um, so uh, again, it's, uh, you know, I want to say to everyone that sometimes things appear a little bit counterintuitive, but that's why you have an executive staff and why you have other staff members who spend time with these budgets on a daily basis. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Thank Michael. You Thank you, gentlemen. Next is board member committee reports. Mr. McHose, anything from student government? Um, just that our general assembly will be next Tuesday, and Dr. Wilcox will be our guest speaker. All right. Mrs. Harshman, curriculum. I'm trying to get Mrs. 
Williams to talk for me, but I'm not sure she's <laughs> any better than I am. Do you, me, do you want me to? Sure. Um, giving Mrs. Harshman's Curriculum Instruction Committee um, report, uh, the Curriculum and Instruction Committee met on October 28th. We had a presentation by um, Matt Semler. Uh, he presented Stride Academy. <coughs> that was very informative. And um, we also looked at proposed course offerings for high schools for 2015 through 2016 and the course offerings for the Barbara Ingram School for the Arts for that same uh, school year. The next meeting of Curriculum and Instruction Committee will be November 25th at 11.45 in the board conference room. Now I, I get now to keep going. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, finance. The Finance Committee meet, a meeting was held on um, Tuesday, October 28th. Mr. Sisler led us in a review of the September 2014 financial report. Uh, Mr. Brandenburg and Mrs. Kajowski reviewed with us the uh, restricted and unrestricted grant reports. We were updated on the progress of the RFP for vendors for the 403B and the 457B uh, by Mrs. Keller and Mr. South. Um, the committee was told that we expect to have um, bids back and perhaps presentation to the board for those um, vendors on December 9th. And we also had an informal discussion of the transition to the uh, new Tyler software system, and we were pleased to hear the staff's great feedback with regard to how that system is working out. The next meeting of the Finance Committee will be on Tuesday, November 25th at 3.30 in the Finance Conference Room. Thank you, Mrs. Williams, for pulling double D. Mrs. Mrs. Fisher, Policy Review and Development. And the Policy Committee met October 28th also. We reviewed and approved the facilities policies and the public charter school policies, um, which were passed on second read earlier this meeting. We also discussed policy JGB and decided that it needs much revision and input from principals and teachers and um, sent it to have some work done. We reviewed and made a number of changes to drug-free workplace policy and the portable electronic communication devices policy, um, which uh, we will be continuing to work on at our next meeting, which is November 12th at 9 a.m. However, before I finish, I'd like to ask Coleman a favor. Could you have or ask the student government if they would take a look at the current um, policy on portable electronic communication devices. Okay. And then any suggestions they have for that policy, could you either send to me or to Mr. Trotta? All right. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Bailey, facilities. Yes, Mr. President. The, uh, the agenda had West City uh, update. Uh, the construction, uh, I wouldn't say has begun in earnest, but there might be some signs of footers and things like that going in at, uh, at West City. Uh, 820 Commonwealth Avenue, the demolition is on schedule. Uh, in, the, in the old auditorium, uh, new furniture for the transportation department is stored and will be on hand for the opening of that. Uh, we talked about a, uh, a new development in, called Seneca Ridge Apartments, uh, located near Interstate 81 in the uh, Morgansville area, very close to Interstate 81. And uh, it, it's not impacting at the current time, but on build out, the students there would attend uh, Morgansville Elementary, Western Heights, and North Hagerstown High School. Uh, saw some prints and uh, uh, the uh, 
information right now is, is rather meager as to what might happen there. Uh, Chad reported, uh, Chad Criswell reported on the uh, Facilities Enrollment Advisory Committee and uh, they are close to wrapping up their charge and will report to the board in the very near future. Chad also uh, demonstrated a program for us. It's called uh, Find My School Beta Program where uh, online a parent may be able to uh, locate uh, their residence and also so the schools that are uh, associated with that area and quickly uh, find uh, where their children might uh, attend school. Uh, it's uh, being modified and uh, improved and probably will be on our web page uh, sometime in the future and have its own link uh, for that purpose. A very useful tool as it was demonstrated. Uh, we, we held our meeting at 701 Frederick Street, saw the work that is progressing there and uh, the uh, target date of January 2015 for the uh, occupancy of that facility by uh, two of our student groups. The committee will meet again on November the 25th at 820 Commonwealth Avenue and uh, take a look at uh, what's happened to our old residents. Going home. Going home. <laughs> Back to the mothership. Yep. <laughs> Mr. Ridenauer, HR? <clears throat> yes, resources. HR will meet again uh, on November 25th at 10 a.m. in the board conference room wherein we will be discussing the consolidation and streamlining of some personnel related policies. Anything from MABE committees? Um, recently, and uh, just last week, we received the overall evaluation of the conference. And um, out of a possible five, those completing the evaluation sheets, um, the total result was 4.6. So I think it's fair to say that um, this year's conference was very well received and appreciated by the attendees. We had lots of suggestions for topics and speakers for next year. And it seemed as though those who attended this year saw great value in the networking sessions and the hot topics. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hardings and Mrs. Brightman and Dr. Wilcox for presenting uh, at the hot topics morning for what they did with um, alternative financing and um, private uh, public partnerships. So I think that was well received and might be something that will need to be repeated for those who weren't able to get to that uh, hot topic session this year. Well, I, I thank you for your work on that committee. Thank you, Mrs. Harshman, for your work on that committee. I can certainly attest to the, the timeliness and the uh, great information that came out of the conference. So, and I know that doesn't happen by accident. So thanks to all those who served on the committee for making it so. Anything else from Mabe? One other item, just so we didn't leave this um, hanging, uh, Mrs. Brightman asked a question about how many students were at um, Allegheny, um, at Hancock from Allegheny. We have one student remaining, and that student is a tuition-paying student. Mm. Okay, that brings us to future agenda items. Just two things that I'll highlight. The agenda plan planning did meet earlier today. We will have an. Uh, presentation on November 18th on the MICA's Backpack Program. Uh, I'm sure many of us are familiar with that, but their partnership in the school system and what they're doing with many of our students. Uh, as well, we are going to try to schedule a joint meeting with the uh, City of Hagerstown Mayor and Council on December 16th. That also happens to be the date that we're planning to meet in a joint session with the Board of County Commissioners, the new Board of County Commissioners. So if we're able to um, get this bo both scheduled on December 16th, then uh, we can discuss relevant projects with both of them. That's all I've got for future agenda items. That brings us to board member comments. Mr. McCose? Uh, no comment. Mrs. Harshman? Mrs. Williams? No comment. Mrs. Fisher? Just it's election day. If you haven't voted, vote. Mr. Bailey? 
Uh, on facilities report, I failed to mention that uh, there will be a groundbreaking at uh, West City on November the 18th. Uh, and in uh, comments, uh, the 18th will be my last meeting, and I hope uh, you will provide me two or three minutes to say goodbye. You take as long as you need, Mr. Bailey. I think you've earned it. Mr. Right now? This is bright. No comments. Thank you. I'm going to take just a, a minute or two now. Um, it's been a uh, one of the great honors and privileges of my uh, well, my professional and public service life to serve as president of the board for the last two years. Um, and I'll have more to say in our meeting in two weeks about the last two years and the things that we have accomplished, the things we haven't accomplished, and what we've, uh, I hope, been able to do for the community. But um, before the votes are all counted this evening, uh, I just want to let um, my colleagues in the community know that I will not seek nor accept a uh, term next year as president of the board. Uh, there's a number of things that go into that decision. Uh, my business is growing. My children is growing. Um, and uh, most importantly, I think, as I've followed the board for the last eight years, the six years I've been on it, and the two years uh, sort of when I was following it and campaigning, um, Mrs. Ober certainly brought certain leadership characteristics to her position in the chair of the board. Um, those were different than the leadership characteristics that Mr. Reidenauer brought as he sat in the chair for four years. And I think that some of the things that I have done have been different than what Mr. Reidenauer has done. None of that's to say that any are better or worse, but I think the board benefits when different people have the opportunity to lead. So after two years, um, I am, as I said, not going to accept or run for another term as board president. I'll have, I wanted to put that out today so that there's no misunderstanding about whether it's the results of elections or whether my decision would affect an election. I just thought it would be uh, make the most sense to make that announcement today so that uh, any of my colleagues who are either here or who may be elected today, if they wish to serve, um, they know what my intentions are. So I'll have more to say about the last two years and the work of the board uh, at our next meeting, but I wanted to let everybody know that decision that I've made today. So if there is no further business before the board, I'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.